<laughs> Rocky Anderson, Justice Party presidential candidate. Did your study philosophy have anything to do with your changing perspectives on that? Well, one thing I remember that really hit me hard studying philosophy was the fact that we are, every one of us, responsible for our decisions. And we have a responsibility to make decisions, to learn about what's going on, and then to make the right decisions and to act in a way that is best. And you, you, you never, there's never a time out. You don't get to say, well, I'm, I'm not going to take a stand on this, or I'm just going to turn a blind eye. Uh, the, the lesson really was for me that turning away from wrongdoing is equivalent to engaging in the wrongdoing. That unless you stand up against that, and say no, then you really are colluding with the wrongdoers. And it came down years later. I read uh, about the different, the three different kinds of people. I think this is so interesting, and, and something really great. I think for people to think about when they're making moral decisions. And Take notes. This will be on the test, folks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here you go. A, a, B, and C. There are the A, the wrongdoers. Those who engage in wrongdoing, who harm other people, they're the perpetrators. Secondly, they're the bystanders. And that, I hate to say, is the vast majority of people yeah, those getting bigger. who accommodate the wrongdoing. They don't do anything to stand up against the wrongdoing, even though they recognize it as wrongdoing, but out of fear or intimidation or apathy or they just don't feel like it's their business, they're not going to bother themselves, then they don't do anything to stop it. And then there's the third category of people, and those are the upstanders. And those are the ones who stand up and don't allow wrongdoing, and they do everything they can to stop it when they see it. And um, so I always really have felt that I need to be among the upstanders. And even if it's an unpopular position, even if it doesn't jive with uh, what's go what else is going on in the community. Um, but you, you, we, we've seen so many times in history when wrongdoing took place and nobody stood up and there, there, people were afraid or intimidated or just lethargic about it. And the wrongdoers then had their way, and so much harm was done in the world. Yeah, uh, recent recent uh, history, of course, uh, Nazi Germany uh, and Karl Bonhoeffer, isn't it, uh, voiced that position exactly, that uh, if you're quiet about this thing, to be silent is to be in complicit. Exactly. Eugene Ionesco's play Rhinoceros <laughs> was uh, an allegory. It's a wonderful play, but it's an allegory about the rise of fascism Absolutely. in Europe. You'd be surprised and how many people don't many, know that name. Eugene Ionesco. Yeah, yeah, isn't that true? But uh, I really encourage everybody, read that play, and then you look around, you'll see this country is full of rhinoceroses right now. Yes. So how does the, how does the allegory work exactly in this? Well, in the play, um, all of a sudden, in this little village, this guy is, sees, uh, out of the corner of his eye, a rhinoceros run by. And then he sees, over time, more and more of them around, and he's expressing, his name is Beringer. I still remember that name. <laughs> I haven't read the play since I was in college. It's one of those that really do stick with you. But So he's complaining to this man that he's having uh, a meal with in an outdoor cafe. He said, you know, this is... We've got to do something about this. All these, all these rhinoceroses around, and and this guy is giving him every reason that oh, it's not not your business. If you get involved, they might do you harm. They're not hurting you. What? Why do you care? All of the kinds of reasons that we hear people give for not standing up against massive human rights abuses, torture, uh, wars of aggression. Uh, what happened in Iraq, what's happening around the world with uh, the kidnapping and torturing of people and, and no accountability for it. Now the President of the United States taking on the authority 
to point the finger at anybody, including U.S. citizens, and have them indefinitely detained for the rest, up to the rest of their lives without any charges, trial, legal representation, <laughs> or right of habeas corpus. Sounds like and, the NDAA you know, to me. If this were happening in other nations, but in this country, it seems like everybody is anesthetized. We should be out in the streets demanding a return to the core of our Constitution, a, a return to the rule of law, rather than allowing these authoritarian powers within one branch of government and ultimately in one person, because it does ultimately spell tyranny. And I'm, uh, I'm curious if you've maybe thought about the agent of change that you envision that has to, has to go beyond individual response to collective response to these things. That is such a great question, and it's absolutely core to any major changes. Uh, every progressive movement in this country, although there were certainly leaders, it never happened because of one person, but they also never happened because of anybody in elective office. It was passionate people pulling together, organizing at the grassroots, and not letting up until these changes were accomplished. Think about it, the anti-slavery movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, the labor movement. And much, in many of these movements, there was a lot of money on the other side. There were powerful, <laughs> wealthy people on the other side, and we were still able to move forward as a nation and bring about fundamental changes because of the passion and the tenacity of ordinary men and women. And that's what we need now. We've seen it recently in the Arab world with people putting their lives on the line, but organizing at the grassroots, using the democratized means of communication that we have now with social media, and overthrowing dictators. We in this country, if we'll get off our couches and commit to this and work together and organize, we can overthrow the dictatorship of the corrupting influence of money in our government. The Occupy movement is starting to evolve into something very close to that. Um, yeah, I, w I was going to ask you about how, how you see the Occupy movement in terms of this agency of change we're talking about. Well, I think it's such a healthy thing. I, w I was wondering throughout the Bush administration, where is everybody? <laughs> With all of this going on? Some of us on the it, streets are wondering the same both thing. Both economically? <laughs> Pardon me? I said some of us on the streets were wondering the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, 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 and especially young people, because young people are always essential to moving things forward in this country. And it, it was really distressing to me to see that, that not only these massive human rights and constitutional violations, but the enormous disparity in wealth in this country, the creation of a, a two-tiered not only financial system, where you have a very narrow financial elite, very wealthy elite, and then everybody else struggling to barely get by, some people not getting by anymore, and then also a two-tiered system of justice, where the rest of us are held to the law, sometimes with an absolute vengeance, especially as the drug laws are applied, uh -huh. but those who are committing federal felonies and undermining our republic are allowed to go scot-free and there's no accountability. White -collar so crime. I think the Occupy movement is a very healthy manifestation, at least a sign that people are getting it, that they care enough to take action, and I hope they, they won't let up, and I hope that they'll bring more and more people along with them. And while well, they're doing all that they're doing, never losing sight that they need to be involved in the electoral process when there are candidates that stand for what they want to see in this country. Opportunity uh, is at the core of all of it. If people are not getting the education, the employment opportunities, we'll never see a closing of that gap. Uh, but if you'll read, uh, Paul Krugman wrote a great book, uh, Conscience of a Liberal, and he traces the history of this great disparity in wealth and income from before the Depression, the Great Depression, until 
well, a few years ago when he wrote, when he finished the book. And tax policy has an enormous amount to do with this. Uh, we built a very healthy economy, built a strong, solid, thriving middle class by engaging in much fairer progressive taxation. And that started getting unwound with, during the Reagan years, although he did, when he saw that uh, we weren't bringing in the revenues we needed, he, he then uh, instituted some, I think he called them fee increases, something like that. Or what, no, that's not exactly the word. I, it, it was something other than taxes, though. But um, then we saw during the George W. Bush years a devastating giveaway to the wealthy. And it's the first time when this country was fighting a war that we've ever given tax breaks. And yet he gave these massive tax breaks to the wealthiest in this country, which are still in place and which have contributed enormously not only to our nation's debt and the interest burden that hangs over us each and every year, but it has made things so much less equitable between the very wealthy in this country and everybody else. The very wealthy are not paying their fair share. For Mitt Romney to be paying, what, 14? 14 <laughs> percent? Yeah. At least 15 percent on his income is an outrage. Uh, and in my view, those who are earning passively their income from their investments, they ought to be paying as much as those who are out working for a living. Also on Social Security, it's the most regressive tax in the world. People only pay, they pay the same percentage, 6.1% uh, or 2%, up to 106000 or 107000 in income. And then after that, nothing else is paid on it. So if you're making 100000 a year and somebody else is making a million dollars a year, they're paying a slight fraction of what you're paying towards Social Security and yeah. Medicare. That's just wrong. Yeah. Well, we've also it's, priced... It's so inequitable the way these things have been set up now. The for-profit colleges just had their way with Congress once again and with the White House. Uh, they, the federal government was going to stop guaranteeing student loans to some of these for-profit colleges that were pumping out a lot of students with diplomas but none of the skills or training to get jobs. Yeah. And so these for-profit colleges, and most of them are owned by investment banks, uh, they poured millions of dollars into the lobbying effort and watered the legislation down entirely. So, that's how public policy is made. That's why we see the kind of uh, outrageous actions by Congress and by the White House. and. I hate to say this about President Obama, but he is right there in bed with them. Republicans, Democrats alike, are feeding from the same trough of special interest money, and it's time that we all realize that and stop voting for people just because they're on our old team. We consider ourselves a Republican or a Democrat, and so we vote for folks just because they still carry that label when, in fact, they are betraying those fundamental values that we believed in all these years. Yes, actually, uh, I was not going to get into this race because of that very concern. And I had a lot of discussions with people. I thought about it a lot. And then it finally hit me. If we allow that consideration to be dispositive, that is, that the lesser of two evils may not get elected, Yes. and therefore always reject a completely different way, a completely different approach. Candidate who will stand up for the public interest rather than the corrupting influence of money flowing into Washington, then we'll never see change. It, 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 a vote for either Barack Obama or the Republican nominee is a vote for more of the same. It's a vote for the status quo. And so if we want to see real change, we need to get behind a candidate like me and a party like the Justice Party that is taking a stand for the public interest and, and where the, the candidate, in this instance me, uh -huh. has 
a solid record decades long of standing up, both for people's constitutional rights, for the rule of law, standing up against wars of aggression, standing up against the military-industrial complex, standing up against corruption in our political system. I've been working on all of those things and more during most of my adult life. So if you want to see that kind of change, then you need to get beyond the sphere of somebody being a spoiler. I think a corollary to that is, where do we draw the line? Everybody needs to ask themselves, do they, as an upstander, have a line that they'll draw, that they'll say, no more, I won't support somebody who, for instance, has so little regard for the rule of law that as soon as he's elected, he says, oh, let's forget about these war crimes, let's forget about felonious warrantless wiretapping of American lobbyists. citizens' communications. I know that was something you just Let's came just out put it your... behind us. I so you just addressed yeah. the issue of him hiring lobbyists. Exactly. And, well, and, and even when he was in the Senate, the lobbyists had their way with Barack Obama. He had promised before he got the Democratic nomination that he would join a filibuster to block legislation that was proposed to grant retroactive immunity for federal felonies committed by certain telecommunication companies in cooperating with the illegal surveillance program on American citizens. And then as soon as he gets a Democratic nomination, he betrays that promise, turns 180 degrees, and this is after millions and millions of dollars have been poured in to a lobbying campaign by the telecommunication companies, and Barack Obama voted for the retroactive immunity. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I can't commit a federal felony and go back and get Congress to pass special legislation saying retroactively that I have immunity. And then it just gets worse. Will you draw the line when a president says he's going to get us out of these wars and we end up having more troops in Afghanistan, significantly more now than we did when Barack Obama came into office? Are you going to draw the line on a president who says he, he believes in our Constitution and due process, but who adds the names of U.S. citizens to assassination lists. The due process clause says the government may not take anyone's life, liberty, or property without due process of law, and yet he just adds them to a, an assassination list and has them taken out. There's been a lot of talk about Anwar al awlaki but hardly anybody mentions his 16-year-old son who was killed by the United States two weeks after Alaki was killed in cold blood. No accountability for that, no due process. And now finally, the latest, under the, the National Defense Authorization Act, President Obama in, in 2009 asked for the authority, and now he got it, and he's, he's signed into law that the president has the authority to point to anyone, anywhere, including U.S. citizens, have them essentially kidnapped, detained indefinitely, it could be up for the rest of their lives, without charges, without a trial, without legal representation, and without the right of habeas corpus. It is absolutely anti-American. It is so subversive to what this nation has always stood for, subversive to our Constitution. I say that. If you're going to draw the line anywhere, that's got to be it. If you're not going to draw the line there, then what are you going to allow a president to do and still support him? Besides that, but, but now the interest is in uh, East Asia. You know, is in uh, they're they're putting troops into Australia. They're they're rattling the the the, the saber at thing. China, which is which is to me one of the stupidest things that could be happening. But it's it's a matter of keeping investors happy, of keeping the the defense contractors happy, and if and the banks happy because they're all implicated in that. And if Obama were to were to seriously cut back and invest in in people, in infrastructure, and so on, uh, he'd he'd lose his uh, his backing his, from the real power, real base. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 if he did that, he would be supporting our nation and and the interests of the American people instead. That's the problem. We we head off in such the wrong direction because money ends up controlling the result, and and. It, 
how rotten it is. With the F-22 weapon system, for instance, you're talking about the military-industrial complex, which <laughs> yeah. President Eisenhower warned us about in his last presidential address, and we still haven't seemed to have quite gotten it yet. But the F-22 system, everybody agreed it was an anachronism. We weren't going to use it anymore. Don't need it. And the Secretary of Defense said, no, I'll take it off the table. So th these folks are smart enough, these contractors. They had other contractors or subcontractors in 44 states. Makes it much less efficient, much more expensive to build these weapons. But why they do this is so that they can get the representatives in Congress to support further funding for these projects because that's how they end up taking the bacon home. They want to get the federal bacon, federal dollars back to their districts, back to their states. And so you see Democrats and Republicans alike, whether it's Utah's Representative Rob Bishop because of Hill Air Force Base servicing the F-22s, or Diane Feinstein in, in California because they have contractors bringing in a lot of money. They fight for billions of dollars to be poured into these programs that are absolutely useless. And all at the same time, we, the American people, are suffering. Our educational system is going down in comparison with so many other nations. There, people are going without jobs, without job training. We ship jobs overseas because of the corporate money that goes into politics, because these corporations can make more money by hiring people overseas. Well, American working men and women and their families end up getting totally shafted. Kirk and Ed, it is it, this is the perfect storm now for a major <laughs> yeah, change it really is. in our government, yeah. a government that will finally serve the people. And the message can be sent to Washington by supporting a third party or yeah. an independent candidate yeah. that we're sick and tired of all of you. We're, we're not going to put up with this anymore. The Democrats and Republicans alike, you, you, you betrayed our interests long enough we're not going to stand for it. And this isn't a partisan thing at all. It, it's across the board. The people in this country, I think, understand, and that's why there's so much desire shown in the polls for a third party or independent candidate. People are understanding that their interests are day after day after day being betrayed by those who we voted into office to represent our interests. I would, I would say that unfettered capitalism, certainly. When, when, when we do what we did with financial institutions through deregulation and set it up so that they could sell these, these, in, these obscene products, these, dr these derivative packages, uh, yeah. these mortgages that weren't w worth anything near their face value, and yet they were being sold as triple A risk or, or triple yeah. a securities because because no they knew that the government would bail them out so there's no risk if somebody is going to fill you fill in your losses but but there was no regulation and that's the point is that, that, that we, under the system of government we're our government's supposed to be protecting all of us not simply wiping out the rule book and saying oh you guys go have at it however you want We'll let this, this market control the outcome. And then the banks understand, like you say, that they're too big to fail, so that they're going to get bailed out by the government if things go badly. And once again, we, the American people, are the ones who get shafted. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I think that the idea of capitalism without effective regulation, whether it's in terms of the environment, no, it, no one should be able to pour out toxic chemicals to, into the air or water that will harm uh, people in this country. Uh, same thing is true of these toxic mortgages and other securities. That exactly. We expect those in Washington to protect us. And when they don't do the job, there, there ought to be accountability. We hear a lot of people talking about the greed on Wall Street, but there has been virtually zero accountability with respect to those in Washington who we elected.
to go back and represent our interests, so this sort of thing won't happen. I just finished serving a year on the Department of Environmental Quality Commission for this this area for environmental concerns, so I'm well aware of those issues. Now, the platform is yours. Yeah. If you have some closing comments or issues you want to address. Okay. Uh, I, well, I appreciate, first of all, you having me on because getting the message out without having to pay for it is so fundamental to our democracy. If voters are not informed, if they don't know what their choices are, we have no democracy anymore. And what is being offered by the Republican and Democratic parties and their nominees is, has nothing to do with democracy. It has everything to do with plutocracy, and that means government by the wealthy. That is, those who can pay for it get what they want. The rest of us are basically enslaved by the state, and it's getting to be that way more and more. People without jobs, or they're underemployed, or there aren't the job opportunities that they'd like to pursue in life, they don't have the health care coverage, uh, so many young people burdened, and many of them will be burdened for the rest of their lives with student debt that is now non-dischargeable in bankruptcy, which but we could spend another half hour on. That is an absolute outrage <laughs> that that could have ever happened. And then uh, 11 million homes in this country that are underwater. They're, they're worth less today than the mortgages that are owned on them. Uh, there hasn't been this kind of situation, as I said earlier, that kind of uh, this kind of economic disparity between the very wealthy and the rest of us since before the Great Depression, since the 1920s. It's never been this bad. So you can either go in and vote for Republican or Democrat and just move the players around within this corrupt system, or you can choose finally to vote for somebody, to vote for a party that represents a completely different way, a completely different paradigm, and who represents government serving the interests of the people of this country, finally, rather than simply those who are buying and paying for Congress and the White House. Thanks so much. Take Thank care. you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there it was. That was Rocky Anderson joining us today. He is the, the viable third-party candidate in this current election. Um, as you could tell from where he was coming from, he's a very rational guy with a lot of experience, and uh, you're going to want to consider him. I believe uh, I'll, I'll, we'll give out his website before we're done. VoteRocky.org. Really? Cool. VoteRocky.org. And uh, he doesn't accept campaign contributions of over 100 bucks.